At 3 p.m. on January 1st, 1995, sensors on the Dropner natural gas platform in the Norwegian North Sea logged what is considered the first officially recorded rogue wave in history. The Dropner wave, also referred to as the New Year's wave, had a maximum recorded height of 25.6 meters, or 84 feet, more than twice as high as the next highest recorded waves in the area at the time. Before the Dropner wave was recorded, a statistical model called the Gaussian function was used to predict maximum potential wave height. The model showed that waves would almost never exceed 15 meters or 49 feet, and a wave of 30 meters or 98 feet was only possible once every 10,000 years. And while throughout history, mariners told stories of giant freak waves that would tower over ships and swallow them in an instant, reputable eyewitness accounts were rare. Oceanography texts barely mentioned freak or rogue waves, and when they did, they were written off as virtually impossible. You've probably seen this image before. It represents research done by the statistician Abraham Wald on aircraft that returned from combat missions during World War II probably the most well-known example of survivorship bias research ever conducted. The areas showing the most hits are where a plane can take damage and survive. The parts of the plane with no damage represent the areas where a hit will prove fatal. In her 2010 book, The Wave, author Susan Casey wrote that eyewitness accounts of the rogue wave phenomenon really only began to appear after the advent of stronger steel double-hulled ships in the 20th century because before that, people who encountered these events usually didn't survive. Following the Dropner wave in 1995, subsequent research began to substantiate the phenomenon, and the first comprehensive scientific study on rogue waves was published in 1997. Since then, while they remain unpredictable and their exact causes are a topic of heavy debate, rogue waves are now a well-documented phenomenon that, while still rare, occur far more frequently than once thought. They are defined as a wave whose height is more than twice that of the next highest waves in the area at the time. These massive walls of water can form without warning and can be extremely dangerous even for the best equipped modern vessels. While we only began to understand rogue waves in the later 1990s, there are a number of well-documented cases of ocean liners encountering these massive waves with devastating results. On January 10, 1910, the RMS Lusitania was struck by a 23-meter or 75-foot wave that did significant damage to her bridge. And in December 1942, the Queen Mary, while operating as a troop ship, encountered a 28-meter or 92-foot wave some 608 nautical miles off the coast of Scotland. The 80,000-ton liner was carrying 11,339 American soldiers and crew at the time, and nearly capsized, listing an astonishing 52 degrees before slowly riding herself. This event would inspire the 1969 novel The Poseidon Adventure and the 1972 film by the same name. In 1966, one of these freak waves proved deadly for the Italian liner SS Michelangelo. The Michelangelo was built for the Italian line by the Ansaldo shipyard in Genoa. Designated yard number 1577, initial plans for the Michelangelo and her sister the Raffaello began taking shape in 1958. While jet travel was already gaining a foothold at the time, a pair of superliners seemed an appropriate fit for the Mediterranean routes. They were the largest liners built in Italy since the SS Rex launched in 1931. The Michelangelo came in at 45,911 tons. She was 276.2 meters or 609 feet 2 inches long, with a beam of 30.1 meters or 98 feet and 9 inches. She was equipped with geared turbines that produced 87,000 shaft horsepower, driving twin propellers, achieving a respectable service speed of 26.5 knots, and she could accommodate 1,775 passengers across three classes with a crew of 720. The Michelangelo was launched on September 16, 1962. Along with her twin sister, they were two of the last purpose-built ocean liners to ever enter service. She featured a sleek white hull design and featured two, dare I say, weird-ass funnels. 
They featured a trellis-like pipework design that allowed wind to pass through them, with a large smoke-deflecting fin on top. The design was polarizing, even though their grape improved effective at deflecting smoke from her afterdecks. She finally sailed her maiden voyage on May 12, 1965. By the time she entered service, jet travel was clearly eating into passenger numbers on the transatlantic routes, and the Michelangelo and her sister quickly struggled to attract passengers. But at least in her early years, she was considered a glamorous option for travelers on the Atlantic, and she saw a brief window of notoriety. It was really getting rough and windy now. On April 6, 1966, the Michelangelo departed Genoa for a regularly scheduled voyage to New York City. She was commanded by senior captain Giuseppe Saletti, a man with over 40 years of experience on the sea. He was nearing the end of his career, and this was to be one of his final crossings. On this voyage, she carried 1,495 passengers, including German novelist Gunther Grass and his wife Anna, the president of the Italian line, and Bob Montana, the artist who first created the Archie comics. Crossings this early in the season often faced difficult weather conditions, and the winter of 1966 was proving especially challenging. Michelangelo's more southerly route allowed her to mostly avoid the rough seas of the North Atlantic, but six days into the voyage on April 12th, as she continued west, she was forced to traverse the difficult weather as she shifted her heading north to reach New York. Conditions rapidly deteriorated. Soon, heavy seas and hurricane force winds thrashed at the Great Liner. The ship was being thrown around so violently that Captain Saletti ordered all passengers remain in their cabins and he directed a change in course to keep the sea on the starboard bow and not directly at four. The Michelangelo featured first class accommodations in her forward superstructure, with windows that offered spectacular views of her prow. In a precaution against the heavy waves that battered her bow and forward superstructure, Captain Saletti ordered passengers in those accommodations move to safer interior staterooms. Further precautions were taken to protect against the storm. Front and side windows and portholes were armored, watertight doors were closed, and safety ropes were put up throughout her public rooms to help passengers keep their balance as they moved through the large open spaces. Warnings were also issued over the ship's public address system, advising passengers to stay in their cabins and avoid any unnecessary movement. As she sailed through the storm, she picked up an SOS from a nearby tanker called the Rocos that sustained damage and was taking on water. Reacting quickly, Captain Saletti ordered the Michelangelo sail to the stricken vessel to aid in the rescue, but soon after adjusting their heading, the Rocos radioed again, reporting that the situation was now under control and they would no longer need assistance. Michelangelo was free to adjust her heading back to New York. But soon after they resumed their course, an air intake on her foredeck was broken open, allowing water to pour into the ship. Captain Saletti inverted the liner's route, turning her prow in the opposite direction of the waves to provide cover from the violent sea for Vice Captain Claudio Kuslich and four other volunteer crew members while they headed forward to repair the damage. As the men struggled to complete the difficult task, the storm around them began to lull. While the heavy seas calmed, the sky above swirled through an ominous array of dark inky grays. With conditions improving, Captain Saletti felt it was now safe enough to allow passengers and crew back into the forward sections of the ship. Ferner Berndt, a businessman from Hamburg and his wife, returned to their forward cabin to change their clothes. John Steinbach, a 58-year-old Chicago insurance executive and his assistant, returned to their cabin next door and several off-duty crew members also raced back to the forward cabins to watch and photograph what was left of the storm. At around 10 a.m., the crew led by Vice Captain Kuslich had finished repairing the storm damage and called up to the bridge to let Captain Sledi know it was safe to resume their original course. Just as she was completing the maneuver, the Michelangelo unexpectedly dropped into an unusually deep trough, almost immediately followed by a massive wall of water that slammed into the liner's prow and forward superstructure, plunging the ship into momentary chaos.
First officer, Claudio Sutoro, was in the chart room at the time, having only just moved away from the bridge's central windows only a few minutes before, a spot where he almost certainly would have been killed. Sutora didn't remember the moment the wave hit, only what happened immediately after. He was plunged into momentary darkness, followed by a rush of water that filled the bridge and swept him off his feet. As he regained his footing, he followed the overwhelming sounds of alarm bells and buzzers emanating from the wheelhouse. There, he found the room flooded, with sea rushing out. Nearly every window was smashed open. On the starboard side, he found Captain Saletti, still stunned, bracing for a potential second impact. The other men on the bridge, having all miraculously survived the explosion of water, were in similar stances, and the helmsman still stood with the wheel firmly in his hands. Fortunately, the helm was still responding, meaning that they could maintain control of the ship. If that equipment had been damaged, the entire ship could have been lost. The captain quickly regained his senses and began issuing orders to deal with the emergency. It's estimated that the wave that struck the Michelangelo was approximately 21.4 meters or 70 feet tall. The explosive impact collapsed a portion of her forward aluminum bulkhead and a large segment right where her forward passenger cabins were situated was peeled away in an instant. Passengers John Steinbach and Werner Berndt were killed on impact, and a young crew member, Desidero Ferrari, would die from his injuries a few hours later. Another 50 passengers were injured, some severely. But in a major stroke of luck, none of the liner's vital equipment was damaged, including her engines, propellers, or rudder. The worst of the storm was over, allowing her shaken crew to patch the damage as best as they could. On April 15th, they rendezvoused with a U.S. Coast Guard helicopter to airlift a crew member with a fractured skull. The rest of the injured passengers and crew filled the medical rooms, treated by the ship's medical crew. The battered Michelangelo limped into New York Harbor on April 16th with her flag at half-mast. She arrived at Pier 90 to an onslaught of reporters and concerned family members. Temporary repairs were carried out at the Bethlehem Shipyard in Hoboken, and on April 20th, she departed for Genoa, where permanent repairs were made. The aluminum panels used in her superstructure were replaced with stronger steel. Aluminum was a common material in superstructures at the time, and these changes were also made to her sister, as well as the SS United States and the SS France. These improvements held up well when the Michelangelo faced another hurricane force storm in December of 1967. Unsurprisingly, Michelangelo's passenger numbers were disappointing from the moment she entered service, and as the 1960s drew on, her numbers only grew worse. Many of the great ocean liners at the time were either retiring or operating as cruise ships part of the year in a desperate attempt to retain passengers. While the Michelangelo's exteriors might suggest that she would make a great cruise ship, her passenger accommodations were divided into three classes, making the conversion to a single-class cruise configuration difficult and her three lowest passenger decks were constructed without any portholes, meaning a huge number of her cabins had no windows at all, rendering many of them undesirable to vacationing cruise passengers. Because of these shortcomings and her unfortunate timing, the Michelangelo had a relatively short career, and she was withdrawn from service in July 1975. Her final voyage was commanded by now senior captain Claudio Kuslich. Norwegian Cruise Lines briefly considered purchasing the laid-up liner, but ultimately they purchased the SS France instead. In 1976, she was sold to the Shah of Iran and used as a floating barrack. She was finally scrapped in 1991. In a way, the Michelangelo and her sister helped mark the death of the ocean liner. They were notorious financial disasters for the Italian line and never found their footing as the industry moved to cruising. Now her greatest claim to fame might be her encounter with a rogue wave, a terrifying ordeal that demonstrated the deadly forces the great ocean liners overcame even in their waning days. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, help out the channel by leaving a like and comment down below. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button for more Ocean Liner history. And now, if you want to do a little bit more to help this channel grow, 
I just launched a Patreon page. There you'll find exclusive updates, early access to videos, and a bunch of other special extras. As you probably know, I create all these videos on my own, and I absolutely love it, but it is a massive amount of work. So I'm setting up this Patreon page to keep the channel going and help me devote more resources into research, securing rare footage, and creating the best videos possible. I love Big Old Boats more than anything, and I want to put everything into helping this channel reach its full potential. If that sounds good to you, check it out in the description below. If not, that's cool too. Watching, liking, and sharing these videos is another great way to support this channel, and I really appreciate every single one of you. All right, that's all I've got. There's a lot of really great stuff coming up soon, so keep a lookout. Until then, be nice to people.